Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, the Provincial Superior of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And once again, it's an honor to have you with us for this week's episode of Living Divine Mercy. You know, the Bible says if we want to receive mercy from God, we need to show mercy to others. In fact, Jesus told St. Faustina, many souls are often worried because they do not have the material means with which to carry out an act of mercy. Yet spiritual mercy, which requires neither permissions nor storehouses, is much more meritorious and is within the grasp of every soul. If a soul does not exercise mercy somehow or other, it will not obtain my mercy on the day of judgment. We are So even being sick or homebound isn't an excuse from doing spiritual works of mercy because it doesn't have to involve physical labor. Financial status isn't a valid excuse either from performing spiritual works of mercy because it doesn't have to cost anything. Consider the story of Blessed Alexandrina uh, Maria da Costa. Uh, she lived in Portugal in the early 20th century. And as a teenager, to escape uh, being raped by intruders, she jumped out of a window and fell 13 feet. The injuries confined her to a bed for the final 30 years of her life. She was very sick. She had no money. And for a while, she prayed for healing, but then discerned that her vocation was to offer her suffering. You know, it is documented that she lived off of only the Eucharist for 30 years. Her example teaches us that being merciful has far more to do with our attitude than our abilities. You know, St. Faustina didn't have much to give regarding material means either, and she was often sick. But still, the Lord named her the Secretary of Divine Mercy because she took advantage of the most meritorious works of mercy, the spiritual works of mercy. So what are they? All right, the first one, we have to teach or instruct the ignorant. You know, some Catholics may be surprised to learn that it is not the local Catholic school or CCD program that teaches their children the faith. The Catechism says parents have the responsibility and privilege of evangelizing their children. You know, it means that we have to have a tight ship, you know, uh, tight restrictions on the cultural junk, if you will, coming into our homes through especially the TV and Internet. You know, the devil's tabernacle is what Mother Angelica once called the television. And be very careful, as I just said, of the Internet. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton said she had a vision of the future. She saw a little black box in all homes which Satan entered. Now that could be cell phones, you know, or internet connections. But it means that we need prayer. Um, it means praying together as a family. And outside of our homes, the need for instruction in the true faith is equally urgent. Go deeper into the faith. Learn it. Like on our Saturday Explaining the Faith series on YouTube and Facebook. And then after learning it, live it. That's what our show is right here on EWTN, Living Divine Mercy. And in so doing, you'll be able to begin to share that faith that you have with the whole world. That's what this work of mercy means. You know, you can't love what you don't know. So know your faith so you can love your faith. All right. Second, admonish the sinner. Wow. This one Never we, <laughs> we never do this one today without fearing getting in trouble, right? This work of mercy or tough love is one of the hardest to practice because we live in this cancel culture. It's really cultural relativism. Don't tell me your truth. I have my truth. You know, there are tens of thousands of different religions in the world now. But we can't have tens of thousands of different truths. There is only one truth. And, you know, many will say we are free to do whatever we want so, as, so long as we do not offend others. No. 
as Catholics, we must be intolerant and judgmental. Ah, Father, what are you talking about? Okay, we must judge actions contrary to the will of God, but we don't judge people because we don't know the subjective status of anybody, right? That's, job, uh, that's God's job alone. If we see, though, someone doing something contrary to God's will out of love, we point out their actions and say how they are actually hurting the person. And because we love them, we don't want to see them get hurt. Um, we love the sinner but hate the sin, as St. Augustine said. You know, St. Faustina practiced this tough love. Um, she actually became known for her, uh, in, I should say, her religious community, for her boldness in admonishing even the older and more educated sisters uh, for their sins of malicious gossip. And, you know, some sisters grudgingly respected her for it. You know, um, one other important uh, point that we should say is, yes, we need to admonish the sinner, but start with yourself. You can't give what you don't have. If you are spiritually dead, you won't be able to help. Okay, third, counsel the doubtful. You know, plenty of people are quick to give out spontaneous, ill-conceived advice. But how many people really listen to you and to the Holy Spirit before they speak? You can become that person for others if you learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Get a spiritual director. Read the Bible every day and listen to the Lord speaking to you um, in prayer, in silence, before you give advice. You know, spending quiet time in prayer is important because that is when God speaks, not when we do all the talking. You know, we could find a good example of this uh, right in the life of St. Faustina. In her religious community, she was such a good listener. She earned the nickname The Dump <laughs> from her fellow sisters because they were always dumping their problems on her. All right, let's keep going. Now, fourth, uh, fourth spiritual work of mercy, comfort the sorrowful. All right, we just talked about the doubtful, those who don't believe. They may be uh, loudly protesting against God or against the faith or against the church, but it always seems that when someone they care for dies or is sick, those same people want prayer. You know, Chris Sparks, who works with us here, says that he messages um, atheistic pro-choice people during tragedies, and they never decline prayer. And our good friend Eric Mall, who works a lot with the poor, says what means more to them in their depression is getting you to know their name, not having you feed them, surprisingly. All right, fifth, be patient with those in error. Okay, we can all grow here, right? In God's merciful love, we ought to share the Catholic faith with those who are far from God. On the other hand, we must be patient with the pace which God is working in their lives, right? Our job is only to sow the seeds of faith in the hearts and minds of those who are in error. But change has to come in God's time, right? Not our time. You know, maybe not even in this life, so pray for them. Uh, trusting in God's mercy, because look how patient God was with us when we've been wrong, right? You know, in fact, the Bible is chock full of examples of divine uh, generosity to those who are wrong or in error, right? For instance, I always wondered growing up in, in class, why was God so patient with the Jews? You know, these people were always in error, having rejected the Messiah. Well, because God is love and mercy itself, as St. Faustina tells us. All right, sixth, big one, forgive offenses. Forgiveness is probably the most misunderstood of all the works of mercy. It does not mean blindly letting yourself be a victim. You have a duty to protect yourself and your loved ones from harm and from other people if necessary. But forgiveness is not as hard as you might think. It does not require reconciliation, for example. Doesn't mean you have to be the best friend and go out to dinner every night with somebody who's hurt you badly. 
Um, it simply means letting someone go and not wishing them harm or worse, seeking to do harm to them. To refuse to forgive others is to refuse God's mercy for yourself. Uh, no person, please trust me, no person, no matter what they have done, is worth losing your soul. Um, please forgive. St. Faustina wrote, we resemble God most when we forgive our neighbors. Okay, seventh and finally is pray for the living and the dead. You know, one of the greatest spiritual works of mercy is to pray for the dying and the deceased. Jesus said, be assured that the grace of eternal salvation for certain souls in their final moment depends on your prayer. You know, later he told St. Faustina, I'm giving you three ways of exercising mercy towards your neighbor. The first by deed, the second by word, the third, you guessed it, by prayer. Now, many of the corporal works of mercy can take a lot of time, treasure, or talent. But praying for the living and the dead, which is accessible to everyone, is even better. And remember to pray especially for those least likely to be prayed for, the bad, the homeless, the criminals, and the forgotten. Now, speaking of prayer, the best spiritual work of mercy of all, let's hear the story of Ben Steele, one of the coaches with the Denver Broncos, who takes time to make rosaries to pray, as we said, for the living and the dead. Today is day seven of Denver Broncos training camp for the upcoming National Football League season. Ben Steele is the assistant offensive line coach for the Denver Broncos. Prior to coaching, Coach Steele's NFL playing career as a tight end spanned from 2001 through 2007. After playing, he decided to enter the coaching ranks where he worked for four previous NFL teams. Ben grew up in the town of Palisade on the western slope of Colorado in a loving Catholic family. I truly believe that it takes a community to grow as an individual, especially as a young Catholic growing up. My grandmother, who I call Granny, she was obviously a huge influence in my faith. Yeah, she, she was definitely, in my eyes, a saint to me as far as how she lived her life. Because of the profound spiritual influence Ben's family had on him in earlier years, he knew the importance of praying the rosary every day. Over time, Ben found out that a career in the NFL requires long, demanding hours. He learned that prayer was a way to reduce stress and help make good decisions. He learned that faith and football could go together. Without question, faith and football fit together. It takes discipline to be a football coach and be a football player. It takes even more discipline to be consistent in your faith as a Catholic day in and day out. You either get better or you get worse, and it's no different in our faith. And I'm always growing as a Catholic, and I'm never going to stop growing. One of the things I admire about my husband the most is he stands firm on what he believes is right, and he doesn't quit. And he knows and believes that what he's working for is for the good of his family. <laughs> ben found out over the years that many others in the NFL share his same passion for the Catholic faith. He gravitated to those who could inspire him and offer spiritual guidance and support. When I was with the Atlanta Falcons, our, our team priest, Father Kevin Peake, he gave us this rosary that was like, 
paracord strong, beaded, like a man's man rosary. Like this was literally a weapon of our times. Ben also remembers Jim Selke, his high school athletic director and fellow parishioner. Selke made rosaries and gave them to folks in the parish to encourage them to regularly spend time praying the rosary. After I left high school, college, and from team to team, he always reached out and I had a Green Bay Packers rosary. I had a 49ers rosary. I had a Houston Texans rosary. Whatever, wherever I was, he made sure that, you know, I had representation of, of the team that I was on. And, and to me, that's invaluable because it's a representation of our faith and that he was so much supportive of that. You like that one, the purple? I made that for Matt Burke. He this Matt? was a Minnesota Viking. Ben wanted to follow in the footsteps of those who inspired him. So he and his daughter, Cora, teamed up to make their own rosaries. You know, they say that the rosary is linked from uh, earth to heaven. And if I'm giving these out to our offensive linemen, we have offensive linemen that are 340 pounds. These gotta be strong. I think the idea sometimes of praying the rosary isn't always super masculine, but then he saw an avenue to make it more masculine for himself, but then also to inspire others. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. I think it's a beautiful thing for my children to witness. It's so important for children to see their fathers and their commitment to the faith. It's important for kids to have a spiritual influence because there are so many other influences out there in this day and age that if they don't, they're easy to stray and be caught up in who knows what. And I started giving them to coaches and players and other different people on, on staff that I worked with. Z! Yes. Dude, let me mean to give this to you. Thank you, man. Check that thing out. Dude, that is awesome. It was amazing, just the response that I got from it. Did you make this? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is so cool, man. I thought these were like so cool that I wanted to share this and to be able to spread our faith. I'm not just making these just for fun. Like this, this means a lot to me and this is a powerful weapon against evil and they understand that and it, they're grateful. My whole reason for starting to make these rosaries was um, to show the power of our faith that can be passed on as a weapon of our faith against evil. Ben feels like he's inspiring others because he's giving the, the rosaries away. So it's like he's handing off um, his work, but it's also like saying, here you go, Mary, take it the rest of the way. <laughs> this definitely inspires me um, in my ministry because God calls on us to be shepherd of, of his word. So when I see, um, you know, coaches and players in the locker room before games and they're praying the rosary that I gave them, I'm like, oh, we got a chance. Well, thank you, Ben, for being so devoted to one of the greatest devotions in the church. Now, let's go back to Scripture and hear about our Lord telling us to be merciful just as the Father is merciful. This is David, one of our guys in formation. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Our model for the practice of mercy is our Heavenly Father's love for us especially in sending his Son for our salvation. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. The Father's love for us is unconditional. He freely makes each one of us in his own image. Then, although we have sinned, he gives us his beloved Son. 
Finally, he offers the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit to all who entrust their hearts to the merciful love of his Son in repentance and in faith. Loved in this way, we are to let that same divine love flow through us to everyone we meet. As St. Paul instructs, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a sacrifice to God. Loving unconditionally does not mean liking everyone or pretending others are better than they are. It means that by prayer, word, and deed, we seek each person's good, no matter what, just as our merciful Father always does for us. Now let's go back to the archives and hear our beloved Father Seraphim reference John Paul II and his words about forgiveness. When the Holy Father was studying to be a priest, he was working in a uh, lime quarry and uh, it was there that he was introduced into the true devotion according to Grenian de Montfort. True devotion to the Blessed to the Mother. Blessed Mother. Mm. And this spurred him on to the introduction he had by a friend of his in the seminary to Blessed Faustine and her message. And this was the entire uh, makeup of the Holy Father. For example, he was in a terrible accident during his work. They could have been killed and um, he forgave the people who uh, were the instruments of it. And um, then he brought that whole experience of mercy that his city of Krakow and his whole country experienced during the war uh, right with him to the Sea of Peter. And he said so himself at the um, first international conference a year after his encyclical on the divine mercy. Uh, during the, after the Angelus, uh, he pu first publicly proclaimed that the mercy message is his task before the world and the church and that the uh, church and the world are actually giving him this task also. And then he had the tremendous occasion to show us leadership in what he understands is necessary for mercy to touch us and others, that is to forgive, when um, he, the assassination attempt uh, upon him was taken. Mm -hmm. On the way to the hospital, he already was forgiving the assassin uh, and uh, then the first speech at the and Angelus. We have, we have a wonderful role in, don't we, of him uh, forgiving the man who tried mm -hmm. to kill him, which is so extraordinary. Well, from his hospital bed, he said, I already forgave my brother. Mm -hmm. And then after Christmas, he visited him in the prison cell. Which is just extraordinary and a great example to all of us of the mercy of the Father extended here on earth. My daughter, I demand from you deeds of mercy, which are to arise out of love for me. I am giving you three ways of exercising mercy toward your neighbor. The first, by deed. The second, by word. The third, by prayer. In these three degrees is contained the fullness of mercy, and it is an unquestionable proof of love for me. The Lord answered me, Strive to make your heart like unto my humble and gentle heart. Never claim your rights. Bear with great calm and patience everything that befalls you. Do not defend yourself when you are put to shame, though innocent. Today I heard these words. Pray for souls, that they may not be afraid to approach the tribunal of my mercy. Do not grow weary of praying for sinners. You know what a burden their souls are to my heart. Relieve my deathly sorrow, dispense my mercy. But write this, for the many souls who are often worried because they do not have the material means with which to carry out an act of mercy, yet spiritual mercy, which requires neither permissions nor storehouses, is much more meritorious and is within the grasp of every soul. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us for this week's episode of Live in Divine Mercy, and be with us next week 
because it'll be the feast day of one of the most popular saints of the world, Saint Padre Pio. So we got some great stories about him that you don't want to miss. So until then, may Almighty God bless you and yours in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.